Okay, hi everyone. My name is Will Vaughn. Um, I am an engineer at LinkedIn. I've been part of the Applied Data Products team for about the last three years or so. And we build data products like people you may know and skills and endorsements. Um, and during the process of this, we end up using uh, Hadoop fairly extensively and a lot of high-level languages on top of Hadoop. So I'm here to introduce uh, Apache DataFoo, which is a collection of libraries for working with high-level languages, such as, say, Apache Pig. Um, currently, we only support two um, libraries right now. There's an Apache Pig library and an Hourglass library. Um, and we began incubating this year. So we'll start with a brief history. Uh, a couple of years ago, LinkedIn had a number of teams who had developed uh, generally useful UDFs. And these UDFs were being shared across the company, but there were a few problems. They weren't in a centralized library, which means that the latest version of the UDF was sometimes communicated via email, it wasn't always properly maintained, updates didn't distribute well, and there was really no automated testing for these. People wrote them once, they worked then, they assumed that they would continue to work. Um, this assumption wasn't exactly true and all the other problems that you would assume from things that are passed around via email started happening. So, okay, we decided we can fix this. So we created a single centralized library and uh, we added in unit tests thanks to pig unit which had come out and we started doing code coverage on this. Um, and we realized after a while that we had something that was actually pretty decent and would be generally useful to anyone who was working in uh, Apache pig at, um, anywhere. So we decided to open source it, and we open sourced this on GitHub in September of 2011, and then in um, September uh, last year, uh, we hit a 1.0. At that point, we decided that we wanted to bring it in to Apache uh, to give it to the community and to help build up a community. So what is DataFoo about? It's about um, making it easier to work with large-scale data. What does this mean? It sort of depends, but it's a combination of providing uh, general purpose things that may make a particular framework easier and about providing some specific things. So for example, uh, stats calculations or uh, sampling algorithms, things that are much more complicated to implement uh, without some experience in that, but which a lot of people can use right out of the box. What else do we want it to do? We want it to be easy to um, contribute. Um, this is, we want a community that are users of these large scale library, or users who work with large scale data. This could be data scientists, data engineers, software engineers. We don't want it specialized to just people who are good at working on the internals of distributed systems or people who are just statisticians. So, what we've done is we've created a fair amount of documentation so far, we've created the getting started guides, and we're trying to maintain that, so for example, for DataFoo Pig, if you want to add a UDF that you've written and you think would be useful to the community, that you can just add the UDF, add a test to go along with it, and then ship it pretty easily. So the barrier of entry for this shouldn't be that high. So like I said, the community is the people um, who use Hadoop for working with data. Um, people who are using uh, DataFoo right now, well, it's used extensively at LinkedIn for a lot of these uh, large-scale data products right now. It's also included in Cloudera CDH and Apache Big Top. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to sort of give this introduction as a series of examples of how to use DataFoo um, inside of PIG, uh, because that is the first uh, library that we came up with support for and um, the most complete at this point. So what is DataFoo Pig? Well, it's a collection of UDFs for data analysis covering statistics, bag operations, set operations, sessions, sampling, um, a whole bevy of things that a lot of pig workflows are likely to do. And the idea is to make it simpler to do these things. So some of this is just general purpose things that happen frequently. One really common case is that you have a script, you've got a bunch of nil values from your input data, you want to replace it with some value. Uh, currently, you can do that in PIG, but it requires a 
writing out a ternary operator, the syntax is not very concise, and you've got to be a little careful with schemas. Also, if you have a bunch of values and you want to take the first non-null value out of that, well, okay, that's a big nested ternary operator. There is no clean way to do it in Pig Latin. Um, how do you clean that up? Well, you write a UDF that returns the first non-null value. So we have coalesce to do that. Um, so in the first example, if val is null, we return zero. And the second example, we return the first of those values that is non-null. We could add a comma zero in there and return to zero if they are all null. This is sort of the example of a really simple general purpose UDF that a bunch of people can pick up and use easily. We want more of these in, so we want to encourage the community to contribute these types of UDFs as we you know, continue to build out this library. An example of something a little bit more complicated is if we want to compute session statistics. So say you've got a website, and on that website you have members who browse the website for some period of time. You want to see who are your most engaged members on the site, and how long are they spending doing what, and how long are your normal members spending doing various things. So, all right, we've got some raw data, which is a click stream of what the users are doing. The first thing is, is we really wanted to find what's a session. So a session is sustained user activity. So in this case, let's say that we will say a session ends once there's no activity for 10 minutes. The user's probably stopped browsing at that point and gone off and done something else. So, okay, we'll define a session with that 10 minute uh, parameter. Um, expect ISO formatted time, so define another UDF that can convert to this. Then we can use sessionize. So sessionize simply goes in it takes ordered input data and appends, or, or pre, yeah, appends to every tuple a session ID. So the idea is that everything that is within this same session will get the same session ID. So we can then go back and group by this session um, to apply some statistics. So DataFoo also provides a number of standard statistics. So median, quantile, variance. So um, we also have streaming and non-streaming versions of a number of our UDFs. So the difference between this is for the streaming version, they're approximations. They don't require ordered input data, and they're streaming in the sense of um, working inside of MapReduce, not in the sense of working with a true stream of data, but they don't require ordered data. We do have the exact versions as well. They're a little bit slower. They require you to go ahead and sort your input data before passing it in. So, okay, we've defined these sessions that we want for our, or these statistics that we want for our session. So now we compute the session length, it's fairly standard pig, and then compute the statistics by just passing it into the various uh, arguments, or into the various UDFs. We can then find the most engaged users using the quantiles, where we defined everyone in the 95th percentile or better as highly engaged. So this is a very simple report that you could use for data analysis. Also, since this is a pretty well-tested UDF, you can use this for production, and we would encourage you to. So another area that we've spent a lot of time addressing are bags. So PIG represents all collections as bags. Um, inside of a tuple. Uh, but the ways in standard Pig Latin that you can manipulate bags are pretty limited. Um, it's especially difficult if you're working with an inner bag, so you want to do something to this bag inside of a nested block. You can do a few things, uh, such as uh, project it, and there are a few operators that do work on it, cross, filter, distinct, a couple others. Um, but there are a number of common things that you might want to do that you can't. So we have provided a number of UDFs to append to a bag and prepend to a bag at a tuple on either end uh, to concatenate bags so that if you have two bags, you can combine them into one, or if you have a bag of bags, you can combine it into a single bag, um, also to split a bag up. So. 
We also provide UDFs that let you operate on bags uh, in much the same way that you would work with a top level relation. So why is this useful? Well, this means that inside of your nested block, um, you can do things like group a bag or count the number of distinct items in the bag or join two bags together in a key. When would you want to do this? Well, it will save you a MapReduce job when you would otherwise probably have to flatten this relationship out, do the MapReduce job to do your group or your join or such, and then maybe regroup again. So let's consider an example for this. All right, we've got a system where we're recommending the user items. And um, the user can act to accept or reject these recommendations. So we're going to read in impressions, which are things that we show to the user, accepts, things that the user decided, yes, I'll accept that recommendation, and the things that the user explicitly said, no, I don't want that. Okay, what do we want to do? We want to know for each user all the items and how many times the user um, saw it, how many times the user accepted the recommendation, and how many times the user said, nope, I'm not interested. So there's a naive approach to doing this, which would be to take this data that you've loaded in, group it up by item and by user for each of impressions, accepts, and rejects, then do a left join on impressions to bring this together, then do another left join uh, to bring in rejects. And this ends up being a large number of MapReduce jobs. It ends up being a fairly slow series of things to pull together. So, okay, well, a better approach is to use co-group. So you can co-group by the user ID and the item ID, and then pull these together. Then you can do your counts, and then you group again to get it to the user level. It's a bit wasteful to have to do this, though, um, because you know that you're processing the same data over and over. All you're really doing is transforming the way it looks and slicing and dicing on slightly different levels. One thing that uh, I've learned while working on these data products is that even really big data, once you start slicing and dicing it, uh, becomes small, or at least manageably small. Where, in this case, manageably small may mean if it's in memory. Well, I wouldn't expect that any particular user's set of items um, to ever run out of memory. Um, I mean, a couple gigs of data would be a lot. So, all right, let's consider that one user at a time. Is there a way that we can make this a little bit more optimal? So, let's only group once. Let's group for the user. Then we have all the user's items. Now, can't we just, in memory, through bag manipulation, uh, do all the other aggregation that we want? So, okay, we're going to define three UDFs. We'll reuse coalesce because it's convenient. Um, and then we'll have count each and bag left out or join. Count each does pretty much what you might think. It counts the number of times a particular tuple appears in the bag and returns that tuple with the count. The bag left out or join, well, performs a left out or join using bags instead of relations. So here's how it works. We have this large co-group um, where we pull in everything by the user ID. We then count uh, the number of times every item appears as an impression and accept or reject. And then we do a bag outer join on these to get um, all of these combined into one tuple. So then we can revisit coalesce and take the results of this to um, get our counts and add in zeros as default values for things that were never accepted or rejected. So this approach allows us to trim this previous job, which was two MapReduce jobs uh, once the pig plan executes, down to one MapReduce job. Um, in a couple of experiments that I've run, this is anywhere between a one-third and one-half wall clock savings. And uh, about a third to a quarter of actual total cluster resources. So, I mean, it is beneficial in terms of performance. In some ways, it's also easier to read because you're keeping everything uh, grouped together a little bit more logically. Okay, 
So another uh, area that we are trying to tackle with DataFoo is sampling. Uh, frequently, um, when you're working with large scale data, you don't want to work with all of it. You want to only bring it down to some. Uh, Pig Latin has a sample operator, but it is basically random. So sometimes random sampling doesn't work exactly for your case. So let's say we have this same previous example where we're loading in the impressions, it accepts and rejects. Um, but we've got a problem because if we just randomly sample each of those, we're not guaranteed that the same uh, keys are going to show up in the correct distribution in all of these. So we wanna make sure that if I have a particular user ID in, that um, exists in impressions, that it, we, it also is going to exist in accepts and rejects. So we provide sample by key. So sample by key will take a salt and a percentage. Um, and then works as a filter func that uh, can go through and process all of these relations and will pull out things and you will guarantee that keys that appear in A will also appear in B if the exist. Okay, all right, let's tackle one other common thing that happens in pig that is actually sort of difficult to deal with. Um, left outer joins, so pig Latin, has support for a left outer join. Um, unfortunately, what it does not have support for is left outer joining more than two relations together. This actually ends up being really common. Um, and it would be nice to just write this, but it's not legal. So how can you deal with this? One way to do it is to write a series of outer joins. Um, that becomes expensive, both in terms of the MapReduce operations that it requires, one per, and it also becomes really unpleasant to write if you're actually trying to project out and keep your namespaces, because you have to do this after every join, or at least once at the end. So it's not the most elegant way to go about it. You can use Cogroup to do something very similar. However, um, if, once you, if you want it in the same format that you would get as a join, um, so without a bunch of bags involved, then you've got to flatten it out. Uh, if you flatten an empty bag in pig, then that row disappears. So you want to convert the bag to null, and you want the correct fields out of the bag. Um, so the syntax to do that is a little bit unpretty if you want to keep your schemas correct. Uh, it's also very error prone because you have to keep your schemas correct manually. So we wrote a very simple UDF that just takes an empty bag and generates null fields for uh, everything in the tuple of that bag. It's a lot cleaner and easier to use. So well, now you can actually write a macro for a left outer join. And pass in relations and keys, and then perform this operation um, very simply. Okay, now onto a personal pet peeve of mine, uh, schemas and aliases in pig. A very common bad practice in pig is to use positional annotation. Uh, I'm sure most people have had a CS101 lecture about why you should use uh, decent variable names. And uh, I don't know why pig developers love uh, disregarding this. This is especially bad in situations where you don't control all of your data exactly. If you're ingesting data from another source that you didn't create, it's very possible that at some point in time this data might change slightly. If you're using positional notation, this means if they put anything new in the data that's not at the end, something is going to break. It's especially bad when it's something that otherwise fits the schema and things just operate normally. Okay, it's bad enough in pig scripts. It gets a little bit worse even in UDFs because the code for your UDF is separated from your script. It's very easy to make a change in the script that looks good and executes and does not make the UDF do the right thing anymore. So let's give an example of how that works. Let's say that we're calculating mortgage payments. Okay, great. So we've got a big file with principles, number of payments, and some 
a bag of interest rates that we're going to calculate payments for. All right. So we write a UDF for this. It looks something like this. You start by getting the inputs to your UDF. You pull them out of the position by tuples. You cast them to whatever you expect them to be. Uh, then you do some sort of computation with that. Um, and you're generating a bunch of tuples. You toss them into a bag. And you return the bag. OK, great. So now you have this bag coming out. You've got your UDF working. You include it in the script. Um, and you, maybe you do better than you're actually doing positional notation in the script. Maybe you actually use aliases. OK. So this executes for a while. It's running. Uh, the data is good. So people are now using it later on in a pipeline. Maybe it's flowing into production somehow directly. OK. Somebody comes in um, a few months down the road and needs to change things for some reason. So, or maybe the input data changes. And a field is prepended to the tuples in the interest rate bag. And let's say this is something like a week over week change. That happens to be the same type as the field that you were reading. So now what's happened is that your UDF is taking different data as input. No error is going to generate because, well, it's approximately the right type. And your script's going to continue to work. You're not going to know that anything is wrong until someone else later down the line um, notices when the data is weird because the right results are no longer coming out. And it's going to be difficult for you to figure out why the data is weird, perhaps. Maybe you can trace it back to a particular point in time, but you're going to have to do a little bit of data archaeology to, to come back and find, oh, this is a simple change. And at some point, you're going to have to take your UDF on one hand, your script on the other, and say, oh, it's no longer exactly where I expect. These type of problems uh, make the software engineer and me cringe. Um, and they happen far too frequently. So there are ways to get around this. Um, one, and the easiest way is to write the UDF to fetch arguments by name using the schema. So now you do have a dependency on your schema names not changing. But at least in this point, if you change the name, it breaks. You're much less likely to make a sort of incompatible change that accidentally goes through without breaking. So we have aliasable eval function data for that can help with this. So we have a bunch of helper methods that um, let you, say, get a double from a tuple by the name of the schema. Um, and this is how you could rewrite that mortgage payment uh, UDF doing that. Instead of using positional notation, you just use the schema name. And then inside of the bag, you can also use the same sort of schema name. And this would solve your problem. So there are a few other awesome things that are in uh, data foo pig. So we've got functions for calculating entropy, open NLP wrappers, uh, some new and improved sampling UDFs for various styles of sampling, um, some additional bag UDFs that are coming on, uh, something for in hash set that functions very similar to the Bloom filter UDFs uh, that are available right now, um, and a few more things. Um, but I think next I'm going to talk about uh, data foo hourglass. So, DataFoo Hourglass is another library that we have. Um, and the purpose of Hourglass is to make it easier to calculate or to do incremental calculations on data. So why would you want to do this? Well, it's very um, typical that in an online website, um, you have um, services that are instrumented to collect events. And these events are going to get ETL'd into Hadoop uh, for later analysis. So, you know, really common things are things like page views. Uh, maybe you want to calculate the number of active users. Uh, maybe you're going to end up using it in some sort of uh, machine learning system later on to discount based on impressions or whatever. So the events come in, they flow through some ETL, they end up in Hadoop, and they're going to end up likely by topics. And potentially they're going to end up there. Um, sorted by day. Maybe they're even sorted by hour, but let's just use day for now. So you have these various topics of the types of events that are firing off. 
uh, you have this sort of schema where they're stored uh, with the topic in a daily format um, and the day referencing what uh, the data files represent. And you want to do computations over time windows. So most of these computations generally take one of two forms. They're either a fixed start window, which says, well, I began producing data on this day and I want to consider everything going forward. Or they're a fixed window length. So I want to consider the last 30 days of data, for example. The easiest way to deal with this, especially if you're using something like PIG, is to just recompute all this data daily. So you go in, you say load all the data, or load the last 30 days of data, and you do a group and account, for example. Um, this would be a really standard operation. Um, but from day to day, your input's not changing very much. You know, one out of the, the t one day has changed, 29 days are still the same. So you're being fairly inefficient. If you add this up over a bunch of different jobs for a bunch of groups for a bunch of topics, uh, it can put a lot more load on your cluster than you actually really need. Same thing, so fixed length window. You've got this one day extra, you want to lose an old day. Okay, how do you do this more effectively? So, um, Hourglass has this idea of a partition collapsing job. So you want to go through and say count the number of page views per member. Okay, fairly standard count. Um, and pig, group by member ID, generate a member ID and count. So this is what you want as the out output of your incremental job. You're going to read in, say your, you know, last n number of days, and output this. So this, in this case, this is an arithmetic operation. We can merge the data with the previous output. So we can take just the new day's data, calculate our aggregates on that, merge it with the old, and print it out. So the architecture looks something like this. You add in the new day, you map back through all of the stuff that you've uh, calculated, you then reduce it in this merge step, and you have an output on your day. So for a fixed length job, you can do something similar. Um, in this case, if I've got 30 days of data, then I want to take the 30 days that I had previously, I get one new day, I want to calculate my aggregates on that, I want to take my oldest day, drop those off, and add the new day in. So it's an add and a subtract. Um, so the framework supports doing this job very easily. And here's an architecture diagram of what it's going to look like once you've applied it to a fixed length window uh, composition. So the key here is that for the hourglass jobs, you don't have to do a lot of work. You have to write the map and the accumulate. And then we've got the merge and the unmerge, uh, which are if you want to collapse or uncollapse your partitions. Those are optional. Um, so that's the easy example for doing something uh, that's basically uh, an algebraic or a cumulative operation. So some operations, you can't do this. Um, so max and min are a good example. If you can't take the max of the last 30 days, see if the new, newest day is a max, and then drop off the last max. It doesn't quite work. You have to store all the intermediate data still somehow. So you can reuse uh, the output still uh, per day, um, but you have to partition the output data. So we have a diagram here that shows sort of how that works. So you, instead of having a single collapsed partition, you have to have multiple partitions, one per day. And this is what that architecture looks like. 
for every day. It runs its own pipeline through. Um, the advantage here, though, is that you don't have to repeat days that you've already processed. So you'll have a cost of, say, 30 the first time you run it, and then it's one day per. And then you've got your costs and your aggregates, but you've already uh, reduced your data size tremendously. So in summary, Hourglass supports uh, two types of jobs. One is partition preserving, where um, consume partition input data and it produces partitioned output data. Uh, the other one is a partition collapsing job where it consumes uh, the partition input data and produces a single output file. So um, now the advantage of this framework is that what do you have to do? All you have to do is implement map and accumulate. So how do I read my data in and what is the accumulating function for it? Um, optionally, depending on uh, if you want to do a partition uh, collapsing, you can implement the merge and the unmerge. So that is about all I have. So do we have any questions? Thank you.